You are watching AYV Television. Good evening and welcome to the interview with me, Samuel Weisbango. As always, this platform brings um, those who are integral to the development of Sierra Leone. And in today's edition, we shall continue the assessment on President Bill's third year in office. What are the promises that he has fulfilled as um, um, those promises he made whilst campaigning for the presidency? And when we come back, we shall introduce um, our guest. Right, welcome back. Um, the show is The Interview, and I'm Sammy Weiss Bangura. And in tonight's edition, um, we have the um, leader of opposition in parliament, Honorable um, Cherno Ramadan Majuba. Good evening, and welcome to The Interview. Honorable. Good evening, and thank you very much. All right. Um, I'm going to start off with a few, few clarifications um, that I want us to make. So um, first, quickly, let's talk about um, the extractive industry. I'm just going to take you on that. I mean, you're on record for um, saying that um, the, um, the, the SIPP government said when your party was in power, it entered into bad agreement, um, terribly causing this state and its people um, hugely and adverse um, effects uh, on the economy. That's why when the president took over in his words, he's going to sanitize the extractive industry because those agreements were not good for Sierra Leone and Sierra Leoneans. And uh, people lost jobs. He said people are definitely going to lose mo their jobs because of the, the things and the reforms needed in the extractive industry. And we've seen SL mining in courts, Shandong has wrapped up. And King Hua started mining. First of all, what's your take with the extractive industry, the, the, the companies that have gone, the government saying there is need for sanity in that sector? Thank you very much, Samuel. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity and having me in this your program. But Samuel, um, I'll start by saying that the extractive industry today mm -hmm. is far more chaotic than at any point in time in the history of Sierra Leone. The extractive industry, you just talked about the King Ho mining, that is just one of them. Right. They terminated the SL mining. We are now in court. We pray as patriotic citizens that eventually a government and Sierra Leone wins that matter because that is our prayer and that's our wish. Because mm. as a nation, we should always be looking forward to what is good. But the extractive industry is far more chaotic and disorganized. We are still waiting for the many, many amendments they've been talking about. Looking, going back to the 2009 Mines and Minerals Act, they said they wanted to review it. We've been three years down the line. It has still not been reviewed. We're still waiting for it. But if you go and see what is happening in the alluvial area, go to Kono, go to part of Tonkolili or the Bo Baumau area where they are mining gold all alluvially or you, the alluvial dam on mining, our waters have been polluted destruction to our environment is in the increase. There is definitely little or no sanity mm. within the mining sector. You talked about um, King Hu. Uh, King Hu has been benefiting from our resources and the, the, the result of that benefit, we don't know where it's coming from because as I speak, we don't have an agreement before us in parliament, nor do we have an agreement that has been ratified by us that which was entered, if they had won, mm. between the government and King Ho Mining. King Ho themselves, you know, I'm sure you heard about King Ho before now. Mm. This very government, the SLPP government of President Bio, 
terminated agreement that the previous government entered into with King Ho for their failure to comply with laws or conditions of their agreement. Mm. The li their licenses were terminated by this government. The very King Ho that had their licenses terminated for failure to comply, they still owe people surface rent in areas they were doing exploration. That is the very company that our biggest iron ore deposits, the biggest iron ore reserve at the in the Faring Bayer area has been handed over to. Yeah. How can you terminate or cancel licenses of a mining com of a company for failure to comply and you give your biggest iron ore deposit or reserve to that very company? It's an irony. But what is more important is that they are going about their business without complying with Section 40 of our Constitution. Mm. We don't have any agreement before Parliament. Without complying with the Mines and Minerals Act, we don't have any agreement before us. And um, there was a press release coming out from the NMA and the Ministry of Mines talking about um, offtake. What they are talking about, uh, probably they, they have still not been informed properly, mm. but it's ha it has nothing to do with offtake because they don't have an agreement with government. So the question of offtake, they have no place there. Right. So definitely the mining industry, the mining sector, right. is far more chaotic than before, and um, we are three years down the line. We hope that they will go back to the drawing board and see what we should do. As I said uh, in one of my interviews. A bad agreement is better than a non-agreement. Mm. And King Hu doesn't have an agreement. So if we, are, we had been criticizing, or even we are still criticizing what happened in the past, when there were agreements, you, they've been referred to as being bad. I wonder what we'll say when we are operating in an environment where there is no agreement. Right. Again, I'm going to take you um, to um, the infrastructure um, arrangement we have in this country. Um, let's go back to um, the new terminal being constructed at um, the Freetown International Airport, Lungi. And of course, um, the bridge, and y y I mean, you, um, you're on record for saying those issues have been politicized. It's politics at the highest peak. Wh why and how? Definitely they are political. Mm. I am sure if the Mamama project was a project initiated by the President Bio led government, mm. they would have forged ahead with it. The cost in doing this so-called terminal, because um, they're doing a new terminal mm -hmm. according to their own dreams and visions. The agreement had gone through parliament, we've seen it. But when you look at the cost implications, the difference between that and constructing the new airport at Mamama, if it exists, is very, very marginal. And as you said, I'm on record. I still believe, and I'll repeat that again today, that the problem with Lungi, mm -hmm is not a beautiful or modern airport. The problem is access. If we don't have an airport that is easily accessible, which Mamama will have, will have provided, mm. definitely will be, will be wasting money. The construction of the bridge, we are still waiting for it. <coughs> we hope it will be a reality because it will connect Freetown to Lungi. It will connect the west to the north or the northwest. But definitely that will not solve access to the airport because the distance itself from Freetown to Lungi is something else. We've, there is a road that was done going to, through Potloko that will assist in connectivity. But having an airport at Mamama will not be compared to doing a new terminal at the, at the Lungi airport. As I said, it is political because um, and I still believe in that. They just wanted to have a project which they will initiate from inception to conclusion. But people should remember that governance and government is continuous. Whatever you meet, if it is good, it's better you continue. They, they did not terminate the, the, the bridge at Obe. They did not terminate the three bridges linking Bo to the Sierra Leone Liberia border. Mm -hmm. they, they continued with them. They are on. So why not continue with the Mamma Airport project, which will be easily accessible to people in the provinces and those in the western area. Going to Bo from Lungi will be the same distance. If you, if you come with your flight and land, you will not come to Freetown to go to Bo. You will want to use the road through Potloko. Mm. If you want to go to Makeni, you will do likewise. So if we had had the airport at Mamama, it will have shortened the distance to the south or the east and the north and likewise on to the west. So this new terminal will not serve the purpose for which we need a new airport.
So the, the argument the government has advanced with regards to um, the new terminal at the Freetown International Airport has to do with cost. And you said if there is any, the, it's marginal. I mean, the difference between the new terminal being constructed and the Mamamaya Airport project. But the government has said, no, the Mamaya Airport project was a loan that the government was going to take, and it was going to be a burden on um, the government of Sierra Leone whilst the um, new terminal being constructed at the Freetown International Airport. Those guys, they will come, I mean, finance it with their own money and they operate it to get their own money. Thank you very much, Samuel. I, I just want to remind you that there is no free lunch. Mm. An investor will not invest just because they want to invest. They invest to get returns. But also, when you run an airport, the government will also look at the burden on its citizens mm. and those that will be, ex be interested in coming to Sierra Leone. The cost, I will repeat again, is marginal. That is financially. Mm. But when you look at the value and access, Mamama will be cheaper <coughs> compared mm. to the new terminal at Lungi. It would have been easier for government to have asked those same investors, the Suma Group, mm -hmm. if they want to do a beauty to invest in the Mamama project, rather than going, to, going for a new terminal. Because that terminal definitely, trust me again, in the long term, financially, it's going to cost Sierra Leone and its people more. It's not going to be for free. Whether it's BOT or, or, or PPP or what's not, at the end of the day, somebody is going to pay. Whether it's going to be the citizens directly mm -hmm. or government through a loan. But it is not going to be an investment for free. They're going to invest now. Are they going to leave their money there? Is it going to be a charity? Is it going to be a grant? No. People are going to pay for it over time. So why not do the same at Mamama when all of us, a place where all of us will have a new access, an easy access, and the possibility of a new city will be born? Because look, at when you go to Accra, the airport area, is, it's a new area. People get excited when they go to Accra. Oh, Accra mm. is beautiful. But most people just go around the airport and then return. They don't go into the Accra proper itself. So we will have had an opportunity to do something that will give us a f new look and a new, basically a new face, mm. so that when people come through the airport, they get easy access, but most importantly also, a plan of a new city will have been born. Right. Let's talk again, um, another area within the infrastructure um, that is very critical has to do with um, electricity, energy supply. The president <laughs> mentioned that, yes, um, there are challenges. I mean, um, transformer theft, people vandalizing the infrastructure of the energy sector. There is also the issue of um, machines that are available, according to the president, to supply um, power. But um, the transmission lines, the cables, they are, they are not adequate enough to receive and supply, I mean, the electricity. And besides, they inherited a very bad energy um, system or sector from the previous APC government that was just running on emergency things and spending money here and there to a point that we had two ships. And now we have one and that is enough to supply. But people are still complaining uh, for electricity supply in their houses. Um, Samuel, I said to one of your colleagues mm. the other day, that campaigning is easier when you use propaganda. But to govern, you cannot govern with propaganda. Mm. So use your propaganda to come into governance. But when you're in governance, it's, it's real and you have to live with it. Electricity is tangible. You see it. It's, you, it's visible. Mm. It's something you see. Even if you want to touch the lights, like the ones I'm seeing, I can touch them. Right. But they are visible. I can see that there is electricity and that there is light, there is energy. So basically, all of us know that um, people are complaining now that there is, there is little or no energy. There is little or no electricity. We have frequent power cuts. Before April 4, 2018, I am sure the citizens of this country know, and they know as I speak, that definitely the energy and electricity generation they used to enjoy, they're not enjoying it today. And I agree with the president with the challenges. I totally agree with him. <clears throat> but these challenges were there before April 2018. But yes, people were still enjoying far more energy than mm -hmm. they are enjoying today. And these machines that are available outside the T&D, the president referred to, <clears throat> the, most of them were around, if not all of them. We were cried down for using a car power ship you say, ah, they, they will be coming with a permanent solution. But not too long ago, it, in Parliament, we ratified an agreement that extended the lifespan of the car power ship in Sierra Leone mm -hmm. for another period of five years. So it shows that what we were doing was right. 
Otherwise, they will not have continued with the car powership if we were doing the wrong thing. But I want to assure you that if we were in governance, had we continued in 2018, we will have taken the energy level to a better place than where it is today because we were making progress. We had identified the challenges and we accepted them. But when the SLPP were campaigning, they knew the challenges were there, but they told the public the opposite. And now they want to rely on the same challenges. The people will not listen. In 2023, definitely the people will tell them thank you very much and they will ask them for the exit. Right. Let's move over to the economy. President Bio sounded very satisfied. He said he was satisfied with the team he has at the, um, the financial sector of his administration because they're doing well. Policies have been put in place, especially when he inherited a battered economy. And it's very difficult to move a country um, that, um, that the economy is so battered to the state that he inherited it. And um, the team at Finance Ministry, Bank of Australia, they are doing extremely well, which is why they are still there. So if we are to go by what the president said, the confidence um, he has in that team, that team, many people were, were, were <coughs> on social media calling that, oh, they need to be, they, that those people need to be fired and things like that. They've restored confidence. They've restored trust in international institutions like the IMF, the World Bank. They, 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 they were gone, according to the president and his team. They were gone. But now when they came back, they were able to ensure they convinced them with transparency, with accountability. And now projects are ongoing. Programs are there established by the IMF that they are funding. Samuel, I don't know where the IMF went. I did not know where they went. Mm. Uh, I do not know that. Um, where those answers or statements are coming from. Mm. The IMF had been with us and they were with us till elections. But when elections are coming closer, the way you deal with these multinationals, the systems do change. Mm. But in December of 2017, the IMF program under our government was also approved by the board. So I don't know where they were or where they had gone to. Maybe um, they were in some place where nobody knows except them. They never left. They did no, not they leave. did not. They did mm. not. They were here. You still remember that um, when we had the issue that surrounded the fuel increase, mm. there was an issue between the World Bank and governments, but we renegotiated and agreed, and the program continued. They never left. But again, the economy. Mm -hmm. The president is right. The minister and his team in the Ministry of Finance are working for him. If he's not satisfied, he will change them. But as an opposition, a majority of the Sierra Leoneans are not satisfied with the way the economy has been run. Most of us are not satisfied. The bread and butter we talked about. I don't know what you refer to as being battered. A battered economy. Mm -hmm. The economy is worse today, so if the economy was battered then, then I wonder how, what will refer to the economy today. The, you know, the dollar was at 750, now it's at a million leons. So if the economy was battered then, this is not battered or broken, I'll, I'll need to look for a word. Mm. But definitely, and when they were campaigning, they knew the status of the economy. Nobody will tell you they never knew the status of the economy. They should not be in shock. Because the current team at the Ministry of Finance, with the exception of the minister, we are in the Ministry of Finance. Mm. And they had been part of the economic policy of this country for the longest time. The financial sector, the, his deputy now who was director of budget, they were in the Ministry of Finance. And they knew the status of the economy then. They will not tell you that the economy was battered. Because we were meeting our, our obligations with the IMF. Debts were being paid. They were saying that we took so many debts. But go back to the books now. We have increased the debt so much that in three years, the debts we have incurred <coughs> are so astronomical that it is not something I and you, you, you and I will want to talk about. Mm. So basically, <coughs> the bread and butter we talked about that they were going to fix within six months had not been fixed. And three years down the line, 36 months, they are yet to fix the bread and butter. As I said, the economy then was far better than today. So if we are referring to that economy has been battered, when our obligations with the IMF and the World Bank were on track, when salaries were paid on time, when the dollar was not where it is today, 
I wonder what will refer this economy to be. Mm. Let, let's get to education. Education, we're going to definitely divide that into two. But let's first deal with the <coughs> basic and senior secondary education. The president introduced the free quality um, education in 2018. And um, now the statistics or data according to from government, um, over 2 million kids have been enrolled and retained in school. We have um, about 7,000 teachers retained, 5,000 more recruited. You have, I mean, for teachers, Who've, um, got, who've been in the classroom for over a decade, they now have two or three of their kids um, acquiring free tertiary education. I, I, is that something we, we should say kudos to the, to the government for? The, the program itself, the free, mm -hmm. the free education, right. is something we should say kudos to government for. Mm -hmm. We must applaud them for being bold enough for taking those strides. But it will stop there. Mm. And Samuel as an opposition will continue to support this government in w to whichever extent they want to go in making sure that education is free. Mm -hmm. But we will go beyond in supporting them to get make sure that that free education also goes with quality. The statistics they are giving us, propaganda is easy. Mm. These figures are coming out from statistics Sierra Leone. Where are the new classrooms? How many of them have been constructed? Where are these kids? Which classes are they using? Where are the buildings that are going on? In 2018, if you say you've increased enrollment to, to 2 million, when there were no new classrooms were added in 2018, when they came into governance, it shows that the infrastructure was there. And we met the budget, the education budget, at 3.5% in 2007. And we left it at 17, 17.5% in 2018. Mm -hmm. Now the budget for education is about 21%. So it just shows you how far they have gone. Mm -hmm. They've not gone far from where we left. And don't forget, Samuel, that um, the primary education had always been free. Beke and WAS examination fees were paid. Not, not just now, but before 2018. Mm. The girl child were enjoying their free education. They were having uniforms. So the primary school today, are they having free uniforms? Still no. So what has been added to the free education for primary kids? The feeding they are talking about, there have been challenges everywhere. We are not criticizing or condemning because we want to make sure that it succeeds. Mm. But we should not be talking about things that are not in existence. Subvention to schools either are late or some of them not just late, they don't come in for a quarter or two. But as you say, you wanted to divide um, right. the, the, the schools from the higher mm -hmm. institutions of learning. Right. So I also want to take the cue from where you want to. But definitely, we had gone far. We'll continue to support them. But the quality is something we are yet to see. You see the results that are coming out for Beke and WAS and the NPSC. They are not, nothing to write home about. We hope that um, in the not too distant future, quality will come in to the free. But I'll tell you, Samuel, we had gone far, and we were doing ours with quality. That is why you'll see then the results we used to see from, from WAS or Beke or the NPSC mm -hmm. are far better than today. So definitely, we need to put all hands on deck in ensuring that the education we're talking about is not just free, but it also goes with quality, so that we don't invest our resources to develop our human capital and then eventually it turns out to be money thrown away without money, um, human capital being achieved. The president also spoke about um, technical and higher education and um, he was asked specifically about the um, Lin Kuk Wing um, student saga and he's, he clearly said that um, they paid the first year fees for for, for the students because, uh, of course, uh, as a result of quick action, a quick response to the issue whilst they are finding a lasting solution. But f um, for over a year now, these students have not had access to um, university education or higher education. Some of them are either mining stones or involved in other, in other things now with no hope of continuing their um, tertiary education. Lecturers in public university um, were, were um, staging industrial action for salaries and conditions of service, which according to them up to now have not been met. You have students um, protesting like the IPAM issue for um, gra missing grades, grades not being published and things like that. Um, what, what's your take on the focus of the government on higher and um, technical education? 
Thank you very much, Samuel. Um, Samuel, um, firstly, let me say that um, when you finish school, your next point or stop is to go to the university. Mm. You don't want to get kids out of school and then there, is, there are no universities to enter into. Mm. When there are challenges in these institutions of higher learning, then all of us should be worried. I'll talk about the recent incident at IPAM late, mm. l last. The strike by university lecturers, these are all things that are of public knowledge. But don't forget also, apart from the subventions I talked about earlier for schools, mm. the universities are also suffering same. They are, they are highly challenged. But perhaps one thing you'll also like to know is the fact that um, the universities, we used to subvent even fees for students. Mm. That is no more. So parents who were finding it very difficult to even afford subvented fees, mm. you just tell me what they're suffering now. So you don't want to get kids going to school and when they finish school, they can't go to the university. We will be having a lot of dropouts because when you finish school and you want to go to university yeah. and you're unable to go, the challenge itself means a challenge not just for government, but will have wasted resources on, on brains that will have benefited our human capital that eventually uh, will be losing. We'll not just be losing resources, but we'll be, we'll be losing brains and the, the value they could add to society. But generally, mm -hmm. The, the, the government has to do a lot more in making sure that our institutions of higher learning achieve their objectives, not just for lecturer strikes or sending subventions on time, but even the level at which they are interfering. Quite recently, we saw lecturers parading themselves as lecturers for SLPP, and people were, were, were applauding them. The universities must be apolitical. They should not be political, because that's where the foundation of society itself is actually formed. Mm -hmm. What happened in, um, at the IPAM a few days ago is a shame. It's not just a shame for the institution, but also a shame for our law enforcement agencies, because look at the way they handle the students. That is not the way you treat your students. Education is a package. It's not just about paying fees, mm -hmm. paying lecturers, or getting free education at primary and um, secondary school. Education is a package. The way you deal or interact with your students itself is part of education. What you give them is what they will bring out. If you give them garbage, they will bring out garbage. Mm. So the way you interact and deal with them says a lot in the way and manner you value or treat education within your administration. Let's talk about <coughs> health, for health sector. Um, the government said it has improved um, the health sector tremendously because even the, the ambulances that they met, I mean, some of uh, mm -hmm. engines were ripped off, um, badly left. They were able to repair them, rehabilitate them, and distribute them across the country. And, th and that process has tremendously helped in um, salvaging the health plight of citizens across the country. According to the divorce, <coughs> um, sanitize the distribution of free quality health um, uh, drugs. Now there is an agency that procures and government is now investing hugely, no more begging donors to come. So government is now taking the lead in some of these initiatives to help improve the lives of the citizens. What's your take? Samuel, again, ambulances were ripped off. Their mm. engines removed. Mm. This is news to me, Samuel. Because the ambulances had been there, they've been safe, and those who were in charge of those ambulances before April 2018 are still in charge. Mm. So if they had been ripped off, who were those that were brought to book for ripping out engines? Mm. Because they were in custody of people who are still in charge of the ambulances. I'll tell you, Samuel, that the ambulances were intact, and all they did was to distribute them. Nothing beyond that. Mm. And uh, we should not be doing politics in, in everything we say. Like we talked about the free education just now, I applauded for what they've done. Mm -hmm. So we, sh we should be honest with ourselves. That is the only way the people also outside will take us seriously. 
the ambulances were there. The free health, which was launched by former President Koroma. It's a laudable venture. You, will, you yourself will confirm you will not run away from that. As I said, government is continuous. Where we stopped, they could make progress. So if there were gaps mm -hmm. and they are correcting those gaps, I want to say thank you to them. But definitely, the health sector is deteriorating mm -hmm. from where we left it in 2018. I don't, you saw what happened at the Connaught Hospital quite recently. There were, there, 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 there was, there, there were concerns by doctors. Mm -hmm. And out of those concerns, a particular lady, a Dr. Cole, suffered physically. When we were in administration, when alarms were raised, when issues were, were mentioned, we go back to the drawing board and try to address the issues. We don't attack the people. Mm -hmm. What we do, go back to the drawing board. But the, whole, the health system, I pray that with the coming of Dr. Dembe as minister, with his expertise, the health sector will be looked into with a critical eye and the issues addressed. We are told, and I think you heard about it as well, that up to date, there is no generator at the, the PCMH, the Oladiu mm -hmm. Center. So these are basic issues that should be addressed. I spoke to a doctor friend of mine quite recently. Basic drugs, not expensive, but basic drugs that most times are bought in by government that should be at the central medical stores, mm -hmm. like potassium and others, are not available at the central medical stores. And these are basic, and they are life-saving. So definitely, if anybody is telling you that there are improvements in the health sector, I will tell you no. And you just need to go down to the hospitals at Connaught, or you go up at Wilberforce at the military hospital, these, you talk to patients, you talk to doctors, the pains are there. But as I said, maybe with the, uh, with the coming of Dr. Demby, we might see a U-turn again. But most of what they meet, whether it's in the energy sector, the water sector, the, I mean, infrastructure I'm not one to talk about because there is little or nothing to talk about. The Regent Road we're talking about was constructed, was signed by former President Koma during his last trip in China. Mm -hmm. The bridges I talked about, Bo Kenema, had been signed and entered into construction, had started. Some of them had gone far, mm. almost nearing completion. We are yet to see any major, major infrastructural project. Right. Before I take you to recent <coughs> happenings um, within the political space, let me, quick, let, me, let me quickly have your take on um, one of the areas the government I mean, has been very vocal and vociferous about in terms of um, its achievements is the fight against corruption. Um, the government has been very, very much bold and loud in saying the fight against corruption has been very aggressive and they've taken it seriously than any other government to a point they've been able to recover so many, I mean, a lot of cash that they've ring fenced for the development of, again, the health sector building um, hospitals and things like that. Uh, what do you make of the fight against corruption? Samuel, I wonder how much money we're talking about that has been ring fenced and mm -hmm. where they're going to use that money. Three years down the line again. Elections are in 2023. The mm -hmm. people will not wait. We have been hearing about ring fencing monies since 2018. And this is 2021, we're still talking about ring fencing monies. The fight against corruption, initially, all of us joined the crusade and we applauded the president because when he came in, he came in with that zeal, and the ACC started. But all we saw was them chasing either ghosts mm. or members of the former administration, of the President Koma administration, all of them. Mm. We are yet to see them chasing corruption as we talk about today. There are a lot of issues, be it in the audit, Auditor General's reports, or the African Express. They, all of these, they have been referred to as allegations. Mm -hmm. the, the Auditor General, Parliament is working on, the, on their report, but the ACC, we've been told quite recently, that is also looking into it, like they've done in some, with some mm -hmm. other audit reports in the past. But we are yet to see them chasing or investigating the actual people or issues we want them to chase or investigate. They are still chasing members of the former administration. It is better to deal with contemporary issues than to go to the past because when you focus on the past, by the time you come back, contemporary issues will also look as will look like past issues. Mm. It is better to address and nip issues on the board 
before they go to the next step. So basically, the ACC has a lot to do, mm -hmm. and there is a lot of work we are still looking forward for them to do, and they should focus on modern and contemporary issues. Whilst they look at issues in the past, their main focus should presently be, their eyes should be focused on um, issues that are happening now. As I said, the, because when you go through publications of the African Express, mm -hmm. they, com <coughs> they publish um, figures, I will not say evidence, but they come with figures, they come with data, they come with facts that should be cross-checked. Mm -hmm. So we need a second look where the government will tell us that check number eight, number so, 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 is not existing. Or a transaction in this MDA between this and this that, wa that was referred to is not existing. Mm -hmm. These are the things we want to see, not just to give blanket statements to say, ah, this is just PR. Or the, they should tell us that the check that was referred to, like they talked about the, the, the Japan, mm -hmm. the president talked right. about that he met in Japan. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I was shocked, the debt we're talking about. Because government is continuous. <coughs> if government change, firstly, let me tell you, there was no debt. That is mm -hmm. where I will start. Before going to the next point I want to make, there was no debt. When, the, when presidents go to these missions, the, um, the embassies in charge of those areas, mm -hmm. they have their cards they normally use. They are the ones who are responsible to be doing these bookings. So the Ministry of Finance will transfer funds to the embassies, except the Ministry of Finance pays directly, which is normally not the case. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> In most instances, they transfer the funds to the embassies, and the embassies will have their, their credit cards, which they will use to do bookings. And then eventually, that's where the hotels will take their monies from. And again, we've been told by the African Express that um, the president and his delegation, those that were listed in that publication, were the, the, the government of Japan took responsibility of their trip for hotels, etc. So these are the things we're saying that they should come out and, tell, and respond to specifics, not to give us blanket responses. The response or responses must be specific. But then definitely, um, the, that hotel um, debt is something we should not be talking about in public because um, it is not a debt that would have, been, that would have e existed for an individual. If we had been meeting our obligations with the IMF, mm -hmm. as huge as they are, a hotel, a hotel bill, mm -hmm. all the good things they met and inherited, <coughs> which they enjoyed, nobody has been talking about them. But they met a lot of good things. And those are the things we expect them to build upon and bring in new initiatives from their government perspective. A lot of promises were made in their manifesto. Mm. Let them tell us how far they've gone in accomplishing the manifesto. That is what the people want to hear, not what the APC did or did not do 36 months down, 36 months down the line. The people knew what the APC did, and they still know today what the APC did, whether it's in energy, it's the health sector, mm. or it's in infrastructure, or it's in governance. The people know. and. They, they, they are still going with it. So what they are telling them now is not what they want to hear. It's about what they have done in 36 months. Let me take you to um, contemporary issues. First off, <coughs> the, um, the, the, the midterm national census um, statistics is about to, to undertake. Um, the statistician general, government operatives, they've all said a 2015 um, census that the then government um, conducted was faulty and um, almost was politically motivated in creating new constituencies and um, districts for, uh, the, for the government then to, to have, I mean, a bit of wider political um, influence and environment. So there is need for a new census to be conducted, tag the national midterm population census. And now um, the, gov the president has announced the date for its commencement. We're just waiting for that date to come. And, uh, but we've seen a lot of other political parties, including the APC, coming together for me, forming a consortium of progressive political parties, calling on people not to participate or boycott the process because they feel it is going to be politicized. What's your view? Samuel, um, <coughs> I'm sh I spoke with uh, one of your colleagues the other day. Right. I granted an interview. And my position that day has still not changed. Mm. First, let me take you back to the point, the statement you made just now. That is to say the 2015 census was faulty. Right. 
faulty where they need to tell us you as i said you, like you talked about the 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 ambulances etc don't tell us that the census was faulty and you don't tell us the areas where they were that census all political parties participated and all of them including the slpp applauded the census all of them and the census was conducted under the supervision of the international community they were here, they provided expertise, mm -hmm. and the census was graded as one of the best in the history of Sierra Leone. So if one of the best censuses in the history of Sierra Leone is faulty, I wonder which one again is not faulty. And if you go back to history, since 1911, mm -hmm. all the censuses that had been conducted in Sierra Leone had not deviated from pattern up to 2015. I will take you back to the one they did in 2004. There is no variance from what was done in 2015. Mm. The population, the number, the demography, the pattern, nothing has changed. But you'll agree with me, Samuel, that um, what was achieved in 2015 in that census, mm -hmm. this government is yet to implement even one third of that census findings. Then you're talking about a midterm census and you're saying something is faulty. It will be faulty because all those, of, all those at the census now are new. When they came in in 2018, they fired almost everybody at the census. The statistics, um, mm -hmm. sorry, at the statistics office. They fired almost everybody. So you, they don't have the authority to talk about the census being faulty when they don't have the know-how or they were not part of the process. If you come in in a house newly constructed and all of those that constructed the building are not part of those that are taking you for a conducted tour, how, how can you tell me about the house? They did not do the census. They did not conduct the census in 2015. And the staff, professionals, who were not politicians in their offices were fired because they were considered to be APC or something. And now you're talking about the midterm census. The creation of Falaba, mm -hmm. a, a chiefdom in Koinadugu district then, not Falaba and Koinadugu now, was bigger than the whole of Bonth district. All of us know that um, when, and if, the, if you want to distribute amenities by district, mm -hmm. Konadugu was just receiving one from the package of 12. Mm -hmm. When you had a chiefdom bigger than the whole of Bonth district. Mm -hmm. So the reasons advanced then are still tenable today. Because I will tell you today that still places like Falaba and Konadugu, if you look at the land space and the population as sparse as they are, their distribution by land space, mm -hmm. You, they are still not being treated fairly. Mm. They are still not being treated fairly. In what sense? By, by, by the division we made. Right. But you, you cannot do everything overnight. But it, it's today, if you go back still to a place like Falaba, take, take Bonth or take Pujo and put it into Falaba. Mm. You, you will see what will, what, what will be left of Falaba. You will create even perhaps even two more districts. Mm -hmm. if you're looking at land spaces, at, at land size. But this one, definitely, we all know that it is politically motivated. Nobody, nobody should hide away. That is why I called on the president, and I'm requesting that for him, not just the faulty um, stats, the, 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 the foundation they have mm -hmm. in itself being faulty, because they, they, they are going about doing cartography without having the blessings of parliament. So all what they're doing as at now is illegal, it is unconstitutional. Because section two of the Census Act I referred to tells you about the procedure. If the president is desirous of carrying out a census or the minister advises the president about the need for a census, a statutory instrument must be taken to parliament. And that has, and not, been that done. has not been done. They've gone about doing their cartography. So all what they did is again waste of resources. Mm. So I am, I'm calling the president to see reason. I'm sure he was misadvised. Like in some other instances, before that he had been misadvised. For him to see reason in calling off the census, because it will not serve the better good. The resources they want to put into the census could better be utilized to provide bread and butter for some of us who cannot afford. We need bread and butter on the table. But the census itself is not just unconstitutional or illegal, it is not necessary. Mm. And uh, no, one will no one will tell me or anybody in the street 
that it is politically motivated. We have, we have started hearing about the results or conclusions even before the going about of the census. So if you know the results, why then go to census? Why waste resources? Right. Let me take you to the cybercrime bill, um, which um, was taken to Parliament by the Ministry of Information and Communications. And the government pride itself um, for being um, democratic, for um, opening the, the democratic space and ensure that um, it gives um, the opportunity and rights, especially the freedom of expression, to every Sierra Leonean to a point that, I mean, the president said, where leaders have failed to venture, he has ventured. Um, that is repealing part five of the criminal libel law. But the, in, the introduction of the uh, cybercrime bill, many, including lawyers, have condemned um, some provisions in that, in that bill, saying that those provisions are more monstrous than part five of the criminal libel law that has been expunged, and because that was criminal in nature. What, what, what do you make of um, the, the, the cybercrime bill? Samuel, again, part five of the Public Order Act 1965. Right. I want to applaud the president again for being bold enough in getting his minister to parliament to pilot that, that particular amendment of the mm -hmm. 1965 Public Order Act. But like the minister said in parliament, again, Rome was not built in a, in a day. He acknowledged the efforts of the former government under President Koma, uh, because they started the ball rolling in 2015. But again, they started but did not conclude. So I will commend the president for that. Coming to the cyber, the cyber bill, mm -hmm. which is before us. Firstly, I want you to know that laws are made by parliament. The executive has brought their proposal. And we appreciate the contributions of the public, mm -hmm. sludge, private citizens, the lawyers. Mm -hmm. We've not seen the bar situation, but we've seen lawyers in isolation. Yeah. So I will not, that's why I, have, I, have, I acknowledged sludge, but not the bar situation. Mm -hmm. I'm a member of the bar, so I no, no offense. But um, we hope the bar session again will come out with a position. Mm -hmm. We're still waiting for it. Because um, they are professionals, and as lawyers, they should assist us in looking at that bill. But before I talk about what some of us will be looking at, I want to commend the minister. I have done it in private, and I'll do it publicly again. Mm -hmm. The minister has been a listening minister not just for this bill, but even the part five of the Public Order Act, he was so zealous for the repeal mm -hmm. because he wanted to go and tell the president that, look, Mr. President, I've done your job. But we had to follow procedures in parliament. And he was patient enough. Eventually, he got what he wanted and what mm -hmm. the citizen he wanted. But as we told him in parliament that day, the part five, was part of the Public Order Act of 1965. Right. Who was in government then? The SLPP under Sir Albert Magai of blessed memory. Again, in, 20, the, the, in 20, 2020, mm -hmm. the SLPP again under President Madabio. So again, in Parliament we'll say SO2, you will put, you put, now you pull, you pull. <laughs> they brought it in 1965 and removed it in 2020. So we applaud them for removing it, not for bringing it down. Mm -hmm. We all need cyber laws, all of us. So having a cyber, cyber bill is very, very important. But laws should not be made for a group of individuals or a particular issue. Mm -hmm. Laws should be made for generally for everybody. They should not be selective. And they must stand the test of time. That is why I want to, again, as I said, commend the minister. He's been patient enough. We told him to go around and um, do sensitization whilst we do ours as well, because they've brought in their proposal. Mm -hmm. But laws are made by us. Unlike um, delegated legislations like statutory instruments, orders, rules, or regulations, mm -hmm. if you bring it, it's either we accept it or we reject it. But for bills, you bring your bill in the form you want it, but we'll give it back to you in the form we want it. So we, will, we are continuously looking at the bill, mm -hmm. and we, we are grateful to the public for their input, and we'll continue to look forward
to the points they will bring in. Because cyber laws should not replace laws that will muzzle freedom of speech or freedom of expression. So those areas that will muzzle freedom of speech or freedom mm. of expression, I'm sure the president himself will not like. I'm sure the minister will not like. Mm. So when we look at the bill and address those areas adequately, as a parliament, not as, not as a party, not as an opposition, because we are looking at the bill as a parliament. We are, we are and we believe that we will be speaking with one voice at the end of the day. I don't foresee a, any point where we will deviate from each other to the point that the, the, the debates or the discussions will take partisan lines. On the bill. On the bill. I don't foresee that. I hope so. Mm. Because um, so far we've been speaking with one voice. That is why the bill has been with us since last year. Right. And we've not rushed it. And generally as a parliament we've been together. And fortunately the leader of government business we have, um, the Honorable Numa, mm -hmm. um, came in with a different leadership style. There has been instances where we, we have disagreed. And it's, when it's politics, and where we disagree, they will take their party positions, we'll take our positions. But generally, so far, he's, he's done his best in making sure that he, he reaches out as best as he could. Mm. I mean, we're all there on our party ticket, so we have our pressures and party positions. But generally, he came, with, came in with, with a style that has worked so far for him. And I hope that he will continue in that direction because um, generally speaking, we have to make sure that what we do should be for the good of Sierra Leone and the people we represent and not the good for our individual political parties. But this bill, we will look at it and make sure that whenever it leaves parliament, it should leave parliament um, with pages that will benefit the people and not an individual or a particular group. Right. Let's talk about the issue, another critical issue, um, the taking away partisan politics from local councils. And the government said it's, it's a way of um, increasing efficient and effective service delivery at the local level. Because when you have political parties represented in um, those elections, then there is tendency for even um, those councils that will be run by other political parties to be starved by a central um, government that is um, run and headed by a different political party. What, do, do you believe um, taking away parties and politics from local councils would bring um, efficient and effective service delivery to the local communities? Before I even proceed, I will say no. Mm. Before I even proceed. And the, that particular justification to say that um, central government will normally starve councils that are not coming from their own political base. Right. It's a shame. Because that is not, not, that is not a reason why central governments are elected. Mm. If we're saying that is the case, then it means that my constituency also, as a member of parliament, will be starved. Because my party is the APC, and the present government is the SLPP. That is not an excuse, and that is not tenable. People want to associate. People mm. want to have control. Even in the most developed democracies in the United States or the United Kingdom, local councils are partisan. Mm. But th that is not a justification. If we have budgeted, for councils, their budget should go to the councils. And if we were saying that, um, oh, it's for, it will make for less political interference, etc., et it will make for more political interference mm. because then the government will be in total control of councils. So definitely that is not, we will, we will not support it. My party is not supporting it. And as a person outside my party, I will also not support it. <laughs> it, is also out, it is also unconstitutional. Because the constitution makes provision for parties to fill in candidates. So how, do you, how, how are you going to deprive parties of filling in candidates when the constitution gives them that right to fill in candidates? And the very constitution makes room for independent candidates. Mm -hmm. If the people are satisfied that they don't want um, partisan politics at local level, let the people decide. But we should not decide as government. Let the people decide down. It is not a decision for central government, be it an APC government or an SLPP government. The people will decide because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. when they go to vote, if that is their wish, all of them will vote for the independent candidate and avoid 
the political party candidates, but they're still going ahead voting for the political party do, candidates. Do, do you feel that's a ploy by the current um, party to actually um, to control kill? No, not to kill. They okay, want, they want to control local administration. Mm -hmm. And one thing that is very clear is that they believe that the way local governance is administered today, mm -hmm. they don't have the control they will want to, because if it is just about subventions, that should not be an issue. Right. And if you're saying if you if you depoliticize local councils, it will help development. Then depoliticize politics generally, from the presidency to parliament, depoliticize everything. Let people contest for president as independent. Let them contest for parliament as independent. Mm -hmm. So there will be no more political parties. Then we close the PPRC. They have no use anymore. It it it. it, it the reasons that have been advanced are political. They are not justifiable. The citizens have not called for independent candidates at local council levels. If they want to, all of them will rally around and vote for independent candidates. That is a simple way of, of coming to that conclusion. So let them allow the constitution to work. Let them allow the citizens to do what they want. Let them don't impose on the citizens. Right. So, so, so as we round up, what do you think, I mean, if there are um, gains in, in, in the SLPP regime in the last three years that you'd want to say, oh, I think these, these areas, they've done a little bit um, more and these areas are more challenging. Uh, before we go to that, yes. we might also want to talk about um, the mayor. Right. Because we just talked about local councils. Mm -hmm. We heard about the leaked audio quite recently. I deliberately used the word leaked because <laughs> it was not a public statement. Mm -hmm. I believe that the Ministry of Local Government and those who are putting pressure on the mayor should also reconsider their stance. Mm. They must give her the space to work. We are partners in development. In opposition, we are government in waiting. Mm -hmm. And as I said to you earlier, in 2023, the people will vote out the SLPP because they've been disappointed by what they've done. We are partners in development. In parliament, I sit in the opposition bench, but I am part of government. So whenever government is doing something that is good, mm -hmm. we always support. You've been following parliament. We've supported so many appointments, so right. many bills, so many agreements, because we have to support the development of the state as partners in development. Mm -hmm they should look at the mayor as a partner in development. The mayor is definitely not a tribalist. You know I am not a tribalist. I will never support tribalism. I will not be part of tribalism. Mm -hmm. But this same mayor who was attacked by supporters of this government from the SLPP office, nothing came out of it. Nobody said anything. No civil society, mm -hmm. no government statement. This same mayor who was attacked by a deputy minister then at the Ministry of Local Governments during one of the cleaning exercises, nothing came about, nothing came out of it, nobody said anything. So this leaked audio should not have been hyped to the extent to where it is. Mm -hmm. When we have had many others at the top making statements far worse than that leaked audio. Mm -hmm. And those statements have been made in public. They were not made in private. Right. Nobody called for investigations. If they want to carry out an, an administrative inquiry for employment or recruitment. It should not just be at the Freetown City Council. Mm -hmm. It should not be selective. Because when it is selective, it's, it will come out as a targeted attack. If they want to do, the Ministry of Local Government has the capacity, let them investigate all councils across the country. Mm -hmm. Let them do an administrative inquiry as far as recruitment are concerned from 2018 to date across all councils. But singling out just the Freetown City Council shows the continued target. People are targeting the Freetown City Council and the mayor in particular. For God's sake, um, I am not one of those who cry the gender cry, but we must protect women. Mm. When they are few, we protect them more. In this case, the mayor should be one of them. So when, when, they are, when they are more, we get, we get better politics, we've been told. Mm. So we are under an obligation to protect the mayor against the continuous harassment. Right. Let them treat the mayor as just one of the many local administrators in Sierra Leone. They should not look at her as the only local administrator. 
She's done a fantastic job. She's doing, and she continues to do a good job. What the Ministry of Local Government should do is to support her, because when she succeeds in her local environment, then central government will also have succeeded. If the city is clean, government will succeed. Mm. Whatever the city council achieves, the eventual benefit goes to the central government. Right. Last year she attempted, she had so many challenges when they were looking at the, the local tax property tax, mm -hmm. local tax. She was targeted as, as if she was the only one who had in the past talked about local tax or property tax. The cadastral system she talked about was nothing new. It, it, it has been operating in other councils within Sierra Leone. It is unfortunate that the Free, Free Town City Council was behind. She was just trying to make sure that she's up to speed with other councils so that they will be on the same page and that development will move on side by side. Right. So basically, um, we must make sure that um, we look at things outside the political lens mm -hmm. and allow administration to function because governance is not in isolation. It is holistic. Right. So finally, um, the things, are there any that you want to say? The SLPP have done, uh, I mean, has done pretty much well in these areas. Um, we talked about the free education. Right. That is something we will continue to applaud them, and um, it is something that each and every Sierra should appreciate. But as I said during the interview, mm -hmm. education is a package. So we're looking forward to the quality, and the package should continue at the institutions of higher learning. So those things that will make the good students from school who are desirous of going to the university also achieve quality education at the university. And the beating we saw quite recently of that lady by the police, police brutality must be stopped. The responsibility of the police should be to protect our lives and properties and not to damage our lives and properties. All right. So the, what happened with the lady is something we should not condone and we will not tolerate. And all of us should say something about that. And I am sure that the Inspector General of Police will also, not, will also not leave that line. I'm sure as the IG of the police and uh, my brother at the Minister of Internal Affairs will also look into that and ensure that those police officers mm -hmm. who, who, um, may, who took that lady through that hell will also be brought to book. Those things should not happen. What happened at the Connaught Hospital again uh, is something we are not happy with and um, I'm sure the President in his wisdom through the substantive minister in the ministry we look at what happened at the Connaught Hospital. So the education, yes, we'll continue to applaud them for that, but we also will, will keep tapping the door to remind them that quality, which we will continue to support you with, is what we'll be looking at more because we don't want to have people who think that they are educated, but they are not when they leave school. And that could only happen with quality. The fight against corruption, again, as I said, they started it well, they've continued it, and um, but the way it is going has not been too encouraging mm. to us in the opposition and generally the right thinking members of society. I'm sure many of them are in government are also looking forward to a more robust anti-corruption commission. So we'll continue to support the ACC in um, actualizing their job, but they must come after contemporary issues. The history is gone now. Three years down the line, you're still looking for ghost um, mm. criminals three years down the line. No, let them focus and concentrate on contemporary issues. And um, again, there are many challenges. Mm -hmm. They've done very little or nothing in three years. So it's difficult to, to pick <laughs> out some of these areas. But we'll right. encourage them because when government succeeds, all of us will succeed. If there is bread and butter on the table, they will not choose a political party. If there is electricity, when light comes, I will enjoy it, you will enjoy it, the president will enjoy it. Mm -hmm. They will not choose political parties. When the roads are good, all of us will ride on the road. So basically, we'll continue to support and push them in doing what is good. But so far, they've, they've disappointed the public, they've disappointed us, and um, the people are waiting for them to go in 2023. All right, thank you very much, Honorable um, Chairman Oba, for your time. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. And there you have it from the Leader of Opposition in Parliament, Honorable Chairman Rabadan Majuba. And um, we've expressed um, concerns. We've talked about the highs. We've talked about the lows in the last three years of the SLPP regime and other contemporary issues. Until we meet again, this is the interview. My name is Samuel Weisbanger. A repeat of the show comes up on Friday at 11 p.m. Take care of yourself and stay blessed.
You're watching AYV Television.